Hello. It's happening. Are we streaming now? Yeah, good. Just double checking. I've been given a thumbs up with a mask and covering actual facial expression. Um, hi, welcome to Did You Hear the One About the End of the World? Uh, live from COP26. I'm Gemma Kearney and hello to our audience. I know that a load of you are watching back home or perhaps procrastinating at work. Come on. Um, we're here to talk about the serious and also the more gigglesome. Um, and obviously our live audience live here in Glasgow. Thanks for joining us. It's still such a thrill to see twinkling eyes. <laughs> Real ones, not glitching ones. Um, today we'll be talking about the role that comedy takes in our consumption, let's say, uh, and tackling global warming. I'm very glad that I'm speaking to some of the experts and funny people that I am. We'll be asking, can climate change actually be funny? I'm very intrigued to see from the audience, like, there's a kind of, kind of frivolity in the air which makes me think that we all are here because we believe it perhaps can be funny. Um, just to really get our heads around this, I want to play a clip before I introduce to you the panel that was filmed here at COP26 by a very, very famous Scottish comedian that goes by the name of Frankie Boyle. Should we play it? Hello and welcome to New World Order from Glasgow where people have started to notice that the COP26 climate conference is happening because roads have started to close. Now the only legal way to travel around Glasgow is to form an orange walk. <laughs> I hope that Greta Thunberg comes to Glasgow, has a look around and decides that the world isn't worth saving. <laughs> Next week she's on Top Gear. If anything's going to be achieved at this conference, it's going to depend on mutual trust. And it's been held in a city where 60% of the chip shop salt shakers are chained to the counter. <laughs> There's going to be climate protests and good luck to those people. But I worry that in Glasgow, it's going to be difficult to tell who's a protester and who isn't. Has someone glued themselves to the road? <laughs> Or were they sniffing glue and fell over? <laughs> so does comedy help broadcasters and scientists alike reach audiences who might not normally choose to engage with the subject of environmentally uh, friendly topics and sustainability? What role does comedy have in helping us navigate the enormous challenge and actually quite a serious one that is climate change? OK, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my panel, a comedian, an environmental researcher who performs live climate change comedy, would you believe? His upcoming book, Hot Mess, is published this month by Headline. He has appeared on various BBC Radio 4 shows, um, was the environment correspondent on Unspun with Matt Ford for Dave, and the state of it for BBC Scotland. He's a former finalist in the new BBC Co uh, Comedy Awards. He has a PhD. Mm -hmm. in climate change policy and is an active researcher at University College London in the Institute for Sustainable Resources, whatever that means. It is Dr Matt Winning. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm very well. Lovely to be here. Just hearing that list of things back to me is the first time that I've been like that. It's quite a confusing list of things for one person to do. Um, but lovely, how, long, lovely. how long ago were you in the BBC New Comedy Award? Oh, quite a while ago, 2012. Uh, <laughs> you were the judge on the semi-final. That's so, right, yes, but go. I thought everyone did well, never mind. <laughs> 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 okay, moving on as a performer, he's toured internationally and has made multiple appearances on some of Britain's most popular TV and radio comedies, including Mock the Week, Have I Got News For You, Would I Lie To You, and Taskmaster. As a writer, he has written seven novels, collaborated on a graphic novel and published Crap at the Environment, a non-fiction book following his efforts to halve his carbon footprint. It's comedian and writer Mark Watson. <laughs> also quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, toured internationally by boat, I should <laughs> Did you? Was it by boat? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, my carbon footprint of my career is an absolute eyesore. OK, um, we're going to go into that. We're going to go into that. Um, and if you are at home and you are chomping at the bit to ask questions, then please do. There'll be an opportunity using the hashtag Ask Comedians. Just simply that, all one word, hashtag Ask Comedians. It will somehow magically appear on one of these many bits of information that I have around me. And I will ask the comedians at the end of my chat. OK, talk about technical voodoo. We have got Maeve joining us uh, digitally and virtually, a co comedy writer, a performer who has multiple TV and radio credits, including on the Comedy Central series Inside Amy Schumer. As a presenter, she co-hosts the Climate Justice podcast, Mothers of Invention, with former Irish president Mary Robinson. She is also a co-host uh, of Neil deGrasse Tyson, I hope I got that right, um, National Geographic series Star Talk. She's written several books as well, including including Maeve in America, essays by a girl from somewhere else, and the forthcoming Tell Everyone on this train, I love them to be published in 2022 by Penguin USA. It's comedian and writer Maeve Higgins. Hi. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm so glad to be here. I was really annoyed that they didn't fly me over, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, do you know what I found myself actually Googling yesterday, talking about getting from A to B and being somebody that has wanderlust and wants to be in places, was how long it would take to walk from Glasgow to London. And uh, it takes oh, 18 hello. days. <laughs> it was quite long, quite long. So. Is that like if you, if you stop and have a drink as well? Or is that <laughs> just you constantly? <laughs> They're just walking, walking, walking. It, w it wasn't defined, but I'm hoping that there's a chance to stop and have a drink when I do it. <laughs> The way the, yeah, you're the, way the trains tomorrow, were last week, you might have to get Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm desperate to introduce our final panellist, John. On TV, he is known best as the team captain of Channel 4's Cats Down Countdown and as the host of critically acclaimed Dave show, Ultimate Warrior. His wife, Lucy Beaumont, um, he also collaborates with. He writes and stars in the award-winning show, uh, which is on Dave, Meet the Richardsons. Beyond his leading panel and sitcom roles, he is a prolific guest on many TV shows, including Have I Got News For You, um, Live at the Apollo, Would I Lie To You, and Taskmaster. How are you not all exhausted? I don't even know. Um, we are, we are. Yeah. He has hosted and guested on several podcasts and can currently be heard on a podcast series in which he takes his co-host through his daily worries from food to climate change. The podcast is called John Richardson and the Future Noughts, and it's called that because his name is, if you haven't guessed, John Richardson. <laughs> Woo! All right, I'm gonna hand it over to you guys now, but firstly, it would be nice to know where exactly our digital panel members are. Where are you, Maeve and John? Uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, okay. that's, that's not where I'm from. I'm, you can probably tell by my accent, I'm actually from Texas. <laughs> And no, I, I'm Irish. I'm Irish, but I, I live here now. Yeah. So delighted to be here. And I absolutely love Glasgow. And I've had some really touch and go shows at the stand there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually uh, just down the road, but I just couldn't be asked to come in. <laughs> <laughs> That's a general vibe these days. It's allowed, isn't it? Yeah. I, like, I just don't really want to go, but I can still do it from my lounge. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm firstly going to come to you, Matt, because you've been here at COP26 for a few days, getting into the thick of it. Yeah. From your climate change, PhD, academic, clever uh, sense of self, that's that side of you. Yeah. Are we progressing? Is something exciting happening at COP26 from a serious perspective? From a serious perspective. So I'm not in the thick of it. I just want to, like, the, yes, you are. the TV show, specifically. <laughs> Um, although it does feel a little bit like the thick of it, it does. <laughs> I'm walking past ministers all the time who are sort of rushing about and a lot of bullshit happening at the same time. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say Anyway, um, but yeah, I've, so I've been there for the last uh, four days now and uh, it was, Monday was very much like nobody knows what's going to happen and actually quite a lot's happened the last few days um, and some people I was speaking to today has, have been saying given the announcements that have happened in the last few days, things are looking more, I mean, more positive than uh, some people expected. So um, we're, you know, 
The headline is that we're obviously trying to aim to keep 1.5 alive. It's like the, the headline, which is like, we've already warmed the planet by about a degree. We're trying to not increase that by another, more than another half a degree, um, which is very difficult given that we are emitting more now than we've ever emitted in history. Uh, and we need to bring that down from record levels to nothing uh, within the next three decades. But uh, someone I was speaking to today that did some calculations late last night after I went for dinner with them, and they've been published, well, uh, they're out there for, from the International Energy Agency today, stating that given the commitments that have happened at COP26, we've moved to something like maybe 1.8 degrees, uh, which is, uh, you know, given that we're, previous pledges looked more like I don't know, 2.7, 2 somewhere around that. Mm -hmm. Or actually the dials moved quite a bit. And I know that all sounds like really small numbers, but <laughs> but they're actually very important numbers because it's, you know, millions of people being affected by those small changes in percentage of a degree. So that was very dry and dull. <laughs> um, the takeout is that there is hope. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, there, you know, people say that, like, oh, it's the end of the world and, and uh, you know, this is... And it would be if we did not if we did nothing it really w would be awful but we are doing stuff stuff is happening and um there's lots of millions of amazing different things happening that are slightly changing things slowly um but we need to change things even faster and we need even more people changing things mm -hmm. is the main message so yeah there's absolutely hope but we're i always like to think of it or what i always say is that we're we're, we're humans so we'll never let the worst happen, but we'll also never like try our absolute hardest. It's like the, we'll cram the day before an exam and make sure we kind of scrape by. <laughs> and that's kind of what's been happening so far with climate change. Mm -hmm. Mark, you're known for a lot of high profile mainstream comedy stuff, but I didn't know that you are actually a veteran in this area. You wrote a book, right, in 2009 called um, crap at the environment. Yeah. What was that? What was that about? Um, crap. At, tell me about the book. Tell it me was about an it. attempt to reverse uh, climate change, but it's more than ten years on now. It doesn't look like it did do it on its own. <laughs> I, um, it was. Um, I well, I watched the Al Gore film in Inconvenient Truth in yeah, it must have been two thousand seven eight, and uh, felt like, um, well, felt like most people that watched it, it would be good to do something about it. I suppose. Um, I. The, I sort of I launched this is how long ago this was if you want to um <laughs> put it into context the mm. campaign at the time was on MySpace uh, because even Facebook hadn't got its claws into civilization yet and um on what was then MySpace and became Facebook I encouraged loads of people to do small stuff you know like uh, recycling reasoning uh, um reducing air miles for food all that kind of stuff you could do in your own life um and I got to, at the time I was invited to go on, Al Gore was training people to do um, climate lectures, versions of his talk. So I ended up doing a, like a comedy version of An Inconvenient Truth, but still with the actual slides with the science, um, which I did for a couple of years. And all of this was sort of, sort of fine, but in a way I was part of the problem because I did a lot of really funny, but well, not really funny, I've never been really funny. <laughs> as funny as I ever get, which is what we all know. <laughs> Uh, sort of second second division like comedy about it, which you know <laughs> did it. That's as in old school football, so, so um, championship now, and um, <laughs> it worked. Like it entertained audiences, and it, people did go away, engage with it up to a point, I think. But a lot of it was focused on tiny stuff, and I think we've seen over the past ten years the, the agenda needs. To, it's still important to do stuff in your own life, obviously, but maybe what's more important, well, clearly what's more important is campaigning for bigger systemic change. And it's, there's a limit to how much of that you can do by doing jokes about it, I think. And that's why I've enjoyed Matt, Matt's work over the past few years has actually fused comedy and climate change in a, in a way that's really integral to it. Whereas what I was doing was kind of dipping my toe in the water. So that, I think it encouraged other people who were also dipping their toes in. Mm. It was like a good beginner's step. But the trouble is a lot of people 10 years ago did good beginner's steps. And as Matt said, we sort of didn't move on from that in a lot of ways because of this human instinct to think, well, I've done a lot of recycling this week. That'll do it, yeah. I suppose. And that's nobody's fault, really, but it is a worry. It's a problem with stand-up that it does touch on loads of subjects for a tiny bit of time, you know, in, in not that much depth, yeah. which is fun if you're watching a stand-up show, but we do need to go into this subject in a fair bit of depth. I, think. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's a lot trendier now to talk about. Oh, Matt's the coolest guy on the comedy show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
it's a lot more urgent now, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. At the time I was doing it, it was kind of an unfashionable topic for entertainers. But again, that meant that I had to ramp up the funny as much as I could. But that in turn meant we got away from, you know, the important stuff, I think. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably at the exact same time would have been very, like, in my early-ish 20s and saw the same thing, like, an inconvenient truth and then went and did a PhD on climate change policy off the back of it. And all right, mate. Here I am. <laughs> We've all, all got different skill sets. <laughs> you know, de horses for courses as well. <laughs> Maybe I, I didn't would, get around to PhD in the end. I would love to ask your input on this in terms of laughter and comedy being such an important vehicle and coping mechanism in current times. Does it help us actually come together and, and get some good stuff done in terms of humanity or is it a distraction <laughs> yeah i mean i i it's so fun to be here with the lads and i actually i saw mark's show uh back in the day and it was cool and like you said it it did make you feel like well i can do something about this and it made you laugh which i think is i do think is important you know i'm you have a scientist there on the panel and you know if you laugh your mouth opens and information can go in so the scientists can back <laughs> me up on that <laughs> no but like both both of the lads there touched on you know oh and then it's kind of like a human instinct to say like oh well we tried or we did this but i i disagree with that i think that really we've been um operating under like huge pressure from like massive corporations and you know, systems that we don't even see that like make us think we're helpless and like make us think that we, you know, we've tried and we failed and all we can do now is, you know, you know, our recycling or whatever. All this focus on individual action, like Mark mentioned, is is quite misplaced, you know. So I think that uh, point, the one way that comedy can really help is in the old way that comedy used to work, which was being subversive because I think now comedy often just um works with the status quo and like what we end up doing is you know we try to get rich and famous ourselves <laughs> and we try and like write shows about things that will you know uh chime with the mainstream and that's not gonna um help the the climate you know catastrophe and like I was thinking when that was all happening, like back in 2001, say, that was when Republican strategists here in the US decided to make a big effort not to use the term global warming. They were like, no, we'll say climate change. That doesn't sound as scary. And then it happened. And now we all do that too. So I think we have to understand that there are really big forces at work um, to keep like the climate crisis happening and that is the fossil fuel industry and that is the banking industry so it's trying to bear that in mind and not beat ourselves up i think and um, and to also be more focused and and more targeted and i think too like having <laughs> having fun is so important and like on our podcast you know it, it gets really serious and sad because you know all these climate crises are devastating but sometimes the people that we talk to who are actually really the most in the middle of it are like the warmest, most fun, like coolest, most relaxed people. And like, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't describe comedians that way. <laughs> I'd say we're kind of like uptight and depressed. But I remember interviewing this one lady and her name is Anne Polina. And she's a river protector in Australia. She's like an indigenous woman and she protects the water on her ancestral land. And she's also an academic researcher and a, and a midwife and all these other really overachieving things. But she was just such a laugh. Like she was just so fun and warm. And I think it's because she's taking action and she's part of the community. And also I think being an indigenous person, um, you know, Indigenous people have faced other existential crises, you know, for many comedians, and we definitely skew white and we skew male, both in the um, no. UK and in the US. <laughs> I um, hadn't noticed. <laughs> let me explain to you. Um, and so, but like, so we have this one viewpoint, right? And it's not always the correct one, but we do have the mic. So it's important that we get it right. Mm. Yeah, some really, really interesting comments there. Thank you so much, Maeve. Yeah. Um, and I agree with a kind of political 
search for fun and for joy. Um, and I see it all over the world and I feel lucky to have traveled a lot as well, particularly to the places that, that are being described as on the front line uh, of climate change and spending time with people from other places in other cultures. And there is a, a sense of joy in community. And um, yeah, and, and I think that we all deserve it because t times have been tough. So we're allowed to laugh. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, it, laughter and joy can fit in anywhere, even at the worst times, which is kind of why typically uh, oppressed people have used it as a tool of survival. And things are that desperate now. So I think it's, we're, you know, we're well advised to do the same. Talking of which, John, your latest programme on the telly box, I actually got asked if I wanted to perhaps think about doing, and I was like, that sounds insane. No, thanks. But now that I've seen it, I'm, I'm really thrilled by the fact that it's out there. And I think it's a really interesting um, way of talking about climate change and bringing this very specific element of the discussion into the mainstream. Can you tell us a little bit about Celebrity Trash Monsters and what's it about? Uh, well, it's a, a very highbrow, deeply scientific experiment <laughs> where I encourage Kerry Katona to wear bin bags for two weeks. <laughs> um, so is there a problem? I see our PhD friend with his head in his hands. I don't have a PhD. I, I didn't see Mark's environment show and I am a white male. So can I just apologize for my existence at this point? Um, and my entire professional background. But um, I, I did it for precisely the reason that it, it's not a show I probably would have done five years ago when I was a bit more pretentious and <laughs> desiring to be seen a certain way. And I think what we're all talking about is reaching people, you know, how, how you reach people and, and say what you want. And if I, the offer came in and I thought, if I don't do that, someone else is going to. And is someone else going to present that show in the way I would, which is to make sure that the emphasis stays on the root existence of the show, which is that it has to convince people to consume less. And I thought, well, I, I don't know if I don't want to watch it on telly and think, oh, someone else has just done loads of gags about how stupid they look wearing bin bags. Mm. So I took it and I thought, you know, people are going to watch that who wouldn't watch a show called John Richardson discusses waste for an hour. So it, it has to be <laughs> worth doing. I have to try and reach a new audience. And sure, if if those people who weren't familiar with me before come and see me on tour, then great. Yeah. Matt, how do you explore mentally the, the yin and the yang of both of your kind of roles from having so many years of an experience of academic knowledge of climate change and then being able to come onto a stage and make people erupt with laughter? Like, how, how, how do you do that? It's great. So I, I started doing comedy a year into doing my PhD as a way to not think about climate change and get out of the house at night. And then I didn't, I made a point of not talking about climate change on stage for about eight years. And then I ran out of material and I decided, <laughs> I'll just, you know, people obviously write what you know. So I was like, oh, I'll try and write a show about climate change. And then I, I realised just about after doing it for, for a couple of weeks that it was actually a, people were much more interested in it because no one else was doing it. And people wanted, people wanted to listen to, well, listen to it and wanted to learn about stuff and wanted to talk about it. I mean, the shows I'd done before, nobody came up afterwards and asked me any questions. And now every show I do, people, there's queues of people going like, oh, I want to speak to you about something. Or So the engagement's there. And I think comedy is a really good way of engaging people because you're entertaining them. You're not, you know, berating them, mm. essentially. Um, so the more that I've done comedy about it, the more I think it's a really good tool to engage people that John's talking about, you know, the people that otherwise wouldn't um, necessarily engage with it or would feel defensive about it. So it's, it's really um, an excellent way at breaking down barriers. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask all of you and anyone jump in here and anyone jump in whenever you want, by the way. Um, does the rise of cancel culture and obviously the influx of social media and overwhelm of how people can actually get in touch with all of us now, perhaps compared to 2009, make it 
a little bit more of a nerve wracking thing to discuss because we're so easily as people with public profiles in a position to be called out for being a hypocrite. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, cool, we've done that. Yeah, move on. Because <laughs> uh, I find that really hard. I'm, I've got, like, I'm a very activist person. I'm very, like, I, I have a lot of empathy and I really care and I really want this world to be better for the future generation. I really, really do. Yeah. But it's sometimes quite difficult to know how to publicly express that and use my voice to full effect particularly not having a phd <laughs> but i am also you know a minority in many sorts and and on a journey that wants to be able to execute you know with to be able to articulate the fact that i want things to be better yeah. but it's scary i have some thoughts on that i can't see in the room if the lads wanted to no one you go go for it mate oh yeah well first of all i think um nobody is like going to get it right all the time and that's fine and also i think you know especially the ones on this panel like we're we're very lucky we're in this position where people are listening to us and yeah we might get called out for mistakes that we've made and that certainly happened to me and if it's like vicious it's horrible but often it's just constructive and it's fine and you know um and it's helpful. It's just like hard on your ego, but I think that's okay. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but like, I do think there's some comedy to be had in that too, because like one example is I, I left Chase Bank, right? Which is like, uh, you know, Chase Bank is the biggest um, funder of fossil fuel companies in America. It's also like really handy because it's on, on every corner here. And it was like the only bank that would let me open an account with very limited paperwork when I first mm. moved here. So anyway, but then I was like, OK, I need to leave them because I'm worried about like their relationship um, to like the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so then I called them and I was recording the call for a podcast and uh but it was like a call center in the Philippines and it was just like this really nice lady. And, you know, I was all on my high horse, like ready to sit to her. You know, I'm moving my money because of your climate inaction. And, you know, you're, and she was literally like in the Philippines quite recently had experienced a typhoon, you know? So it's like, mm. I think there's some comedy value in like how ludicrous we behave sometimes trying to do the right thing. And it's fine if we look stupid and it's fine if people give out to us on Instagram. I think the important thing is trying and learning and trying and learning and also asking for help when we're not sure about something. And um, I personally don't really feel powerful enough to ever get cancelled. So <laughs> my career has never gotten that big. So that's yeah. lucky. But I would also say who, who gets cancelled? Like I mean, yeah. we talk about, by that meaning like a backlash you might trend on Twitter for a day, but there are men who've sexually yeah. assaulted people who are still gigging. So do you know yeah. what I mean? I don't think we should be afraid of doing Yeah, a few we'll get away with a plastic bag or two. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, I think what I was going to say was fairly similar to what Mo said, basically, which is... Um, Oh, can you do my accent too, Mark? Oh, I, I don't mean I meant to deliver it the way that you did now. I, yeah, I remember when I walked away from Chase Bank myself. Um, it, basically, like, um, a, a certain level of hypocrisy is almost inevitable because, you know, and, and I think you can let that sort of criticism wash over you a little bit. As Maeve says, it can be a little bit upsetting, but because it's been a feature of the coverage of this conference, like every climate conference, you know, it's, immediately you get people going, oh, someone flew there. There's people there that have looked at a car recently. Yeah, I, this, is, this, you know, <laughs> this, this happened to Al Gore again. I'm not, I'm not saying that Al Gore's record is spotless, but every time Al Gore so much as looked up a holiday on, you, uh, the internet, people would be like, <laughs> but I thought you said we couldn't have planes anymore. And um, there is this kind of almost mania for spotting hypocrisy of people. Every time yeah. Greta Thunberg opens her mouth, someone's like, she's got clothes on, they were made by someone, that took energy. And you, you, the, this, this, um, this culture of point scoring is uh, needlessly weighs down the, the conversation. Like all of us are aware that individually, we're constantly doing things that consume energy and that we, we could be doing better. But like Maeve said, part of the reason for that is that, that um, as individuals, we are constrained by massive machines that have kept us in place. So, you know, I feel like 10 years ago, maybe there was still time for people to say, you can't 
criticise people for driving. You've got you know, all of this kind of back and forth. But, but basically, that doesn't matter anymore. If progress is made by this conference, for example, they don't think it matters too much if some people here you know, have got the wrong pair of trousers on or something. I think we probably do need to move beyond that. So if it was me and I made a point which I thought was right about, yeah, yours are fine, Matt, but, but you've got your PhD, of course. Um, yeah, I feel like if I tweeted something about climate or anything else and someone said, yeah, but what about you doing this? Sort of stuff, I, as May have said, I would probably try and have the dignity to say, yeah, you're right, but I think my point is still right. And, and I think that about everything. Every time Gary Lineker or someone, you know, with an enormous platform makes a good political point, immediately 28 people will tweet him going, yeah, but you advertise crisps and you won't shat yourself in a match. <laughs> and, like, like, you know, and if I'm Lineker, I'm saying, yes, those things are true, but my wider point is awesome. Yes. I, I, and that is a problem with Twitter. So much of it is about playground style bickering. But we, with this being as serious as it obviously is, we sort of have to, as in, like Maeve said, you've sort of got to bury your ego a bit. If you think something's worth saying, it's worth saying, even if a dozen people tweet crap back at you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I do that. I'm terrified of, of the backlash. All of us are. Yeah. But she is right. You've, it's really only your ego and stuff is bigger than that. Yeah, and I think that we all have to recognise like people streaming this at home, um, people here in the audience, all of us with different platforms, different jobs, different lives, that it, this is very much about collective action uh, and any vehicle in us coming to kind of realisations collectively and perhaps even in laughter, I think is probably worth it rather than the energy spent quite literally on nitpicking about stuff that we've frankly, in the Western world, all got really wrong for quite a long time. So we're reconditioning culture as a whole. It's a pretty hard job and <laughs> growing pains of palpable, yeah. but definitely worth it um, for the next generation, but, if not I, ours. Can I just add, when you said things that we all got really wrong, which I, like, I, yes. But mainly it was a tiny number of people who yeah. have made millions and millions and billions and billions <laughs> of pounds and dollars, you know, from creating this crisis. So yes, we are individually responsible and, you know, as you know, our lifestyles are a bit out of control, but that didn't come from nowhere. Like it's, you know, it's some people still have a huge investment and huge interest in keeping this going. So to kind of, I think this comedy thing of punching up rather than punching down is, is useful mm. here, right? Like to kind of look up and see, well, like who's still benefiting from this? Who's benefiting from denying? Who's benefiting from delaying? And let's go after them instead of like going after one another or going after people who are trying to help out. Yes, love it. So I would like to ask each of the panel whether there's been anything that you have perhaps turned down because of political climate change or climate crisis reasons. Any, anything that you've been like, I just, even though the money sounds very appealing, I just can't take that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was contacted in the last year to do an educational campaign in schools for a major, major oil company. Right which I said no to mm. <laughs> quite quickly. Um, I'm not allowed to name them, obviously. But there aren't loads of all But there aren't that many, so, <laughs> you know, just pick one. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a difficult thing to do, but I think, yeah, you need to be... Uh, and it's really difficult, I think, probably for comedians as well, to because you kind of like then have to go into detail of like, is this company really, like, is it genuine? They've got loads of stuff on their website that looks nice. <laughs> And kind of what Joe's showing, you know, there's loads of pictures of nice trees and windmills and stuff. And we're at that stage where um, there is so much kind of greenwashing happening uh, at the moment because basically the social license of these companies to operate and con to continue doing what they're doing are dependent upon every single one of us buying into it and, and saying, oh, it's fine, you can keep doing what. And so, so they're spending more and more money as a percentage of uh, their advertising, they spend in, I, I can't, I, it's in my book, do buy it. I can't <laughs> remember the figure off the top of my head, but they're spending, you know, a, quite a large percentage on carbon uh, advertising uh, to make themselves look green. And, you know, the amount of spending in terms of the investments that they're putting in to renewables or to carbon capture technologies are still very, very small in comparison. So, yeah, it, it is um, pretty mad. I guess I can say, I mean, you've shown stuff about Shell already. So, so Shell's... <laughs> uh, to be fair, Shell 
wasn't very well disguised there. No, no, no. <laughs> it was quite, but so, so, so Shell um, were recently taken to the court in the Netherlands and told that they need to reduce their emissions by 45% by 2030 to be in line with the Paris Agreement, which they are appealing. Now, Shell's target that they set themselves was that they wouldn't have an increase in emission, the emissions intensity of their production, I think, by 2030, which um, really complicated. Like, again, it's, really, it's quite complicated to go into detail on this, but it's, it, the emissions intensity means how much emissions there are per, per, per amount of production. So the way that I, I try to describe it is like, if you, you could reduce the emission, uh, the alcohol intensity of how much you drink a week by drinking like three extra amounts of low, carb, uh, of low alcohol beer, you're still drinking the same amount of beer. You're just adding sort of more low alcohol beer so that your overall intensity of the, the be, you know, the percentage of the beer that you've... You're just anyway, having a worse time. You're, yeah, exactly. You're, <laughs> Anyway, just to say that um, uh, people need to be aware of what companies are saying out there. And there's a lot of uh, companies saying, we're going to do this thing in 30 years' time. But what they're actually saying they're going to do in the next 10 years is, uh, you know, not particularly great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rather than the jobs that we're not going to do kind of in the business, what life hacks can we actually give all of us, you know, regardless of whether we're lucky enough to be in show business, um, have we come across collectively anything that is really good for us to go and tell our fans about back home? You know, like, what can we do? One, one thing. John. I mean, there's, there's low, I, and what I would say broadly that the job of comics is, is to make the the solutions look more fun because that's what comedy is comedy is about laughing and enjoying and we are people that when you see a comic on telly you feel better because you think oh that's my friend because we share ideas and if we start talking about without being overt about i'm going to do a routine on veganism and here it is and it's full of facts about methane emissions and slaughter if you tell a really funny routine that happens while you're eating vegan food you are part i think of selling the solution as more entertaining and more fun than the current problem we're in um so but you know if you want advice out that mave's exactly right get your money out of the huge banks so you can do that tomorrow you can bank with someone like triados who are committed to not investing in uh, fossil fuels and things like that mm -hmm. you can uh, switch your energy supply immediately like within you could do it on a nap in the foyer uh, or now while you're watching this you could switch your energy supplier to a green supplier that they take like you know that's a day of admin and they're really easy things to do they're not remotely amusing <laughs> is there is there anyone on the comedy scene or like some content that we can put on our list of what we might want to be watching as well is there anyone doing this incredibly obviously we've played clips of some great stuff that's been on the telly so perhaps it's your own show but can anybody yeah the four of us yeah, all of your books. Yeah. Actually, Lily Cole, who was featured in that Joe Lysett clip, she's got an amazing book called yeah. Who Cares Wins? Again, filled with tips and advice that is very accessible. Um, Maeve, I feel like you're a wise person for us to, to ask at this particular point. <laughs> I have a kind, I love what John said. I, I have a kind of a vaguer uh, thing to do, which has served me very well. And that is to um, try and figure out my values. And so two of my values are um, be on the side of justice. And, and then another one is like, um, have fun. So like generally, if you do those two things and it does require research, because like Matt was saying, often like a company can contact you and they're like, we think you're such an awesome storyteller and we would love for you to blah, blah. And it's tempting. But then you think like, well, actually, I can I pretty much know. And this goes for everybody. You don't have to be in in show business. But I think it's like if you just check in with yourself, like what feels right and that could be that you're motivated by economic justice or racial justice. Essentially, they're all linked to climate justice anyway. So you won't really put a foot wrong. Or if you do, you'll get back on track easily enough. If you just try and like remember what's really important to you, that's generally going to help the community too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm going to maybe hand it over to the audience. Are you up for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If anyone has any tips, just feel free to fly them out of your mouth because I feel like we're all like re-educating ourselves here. I, I'd just like to say, so the, the other thing is that it depends on how much of a, an influence you have or how much you consume, how wealthy you are. So, you know, the average carbon footprint of a person in the UK is about seven uh, tonnes uh, of greenhouse gases a year, which is qu quite a lot. Like you can get about what 20 kilograms on a suitcase so that's, I don't know, a good few hundred suitcases that every, every one of us is throwing into the atmosphere every year. Um, but if you're, if you're at the lower end of that scale, you know, if, if you're essentially just getting by day to day, your carbon footprint does not matter. You know what I mean? So people in, in poverty, people in, uh, you know, that are kind of just getting by, th that is not important at all. For, for them to, to be doing anything about what they're eating or, you know, if you have to eat meat because it's cheaper, you should eat meat because it's cheaper, that sort of thing. But if you are at the higher end, if you are, you know, consuming a lot, you should look at your own lifestyle. I, don't, I still don't think those people should be judged. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's good to judge anybody about anything. But if, you're, if you are, you, you can look at yourself and then make judgments yourself. And then if you are doing positive things, you should talk about those things because I think that's the best way to get people to, and I, you know, as John was saying, be positive about it. So it's like, oh, I'm doing this thing and I, I've, it's really been much better, you know. Mm. I, haven't, I haven't been on a flight for three and a half years and I, I mean, I've not missed it. And, I, you know, it's fine. I just take I took a train to Italy and it was quite exciting. Yeah, stuff like that. amazing. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just kind of changing the, the way you talk about stuff. Mm. I love, I love hearing, I love hearing that, Matt, because I used to be really bad because, like, I'm Irish and I'm female, and I, I grew up Catholic, so I was always like the holy trinity of self-deprecating. But now, if I do anything good or or even vaguely okay, like I tip the barista, I show off about it so much, <laughs> and it makes me pretty annoying. But it's also, I do think it helps to make other people think, oh yeah, like doing the right thing is like not, you know, not the worst. But the other thing you said about like not judging people, that's my hobby, and I can't give it up. And it's carbon neutral, <laughs> and I love judging people. It's one of the thieves of joy, apparently. Judgment, comparison. <laughs> And I expectation. You hear that? Thief, Maybe you're, a jo of you're a joy thief. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a joy okay, thief. I, we've only me, got man. <laughs> 12 minutes left, so I, I really have to hand it over to our, our audience who are really excited to ask these questions. Leslie says Matt and Mark have talked about carefully ramping the comedy up or down so the climate change mes message isn't lost. What is the most genuinely strange or bizarre aspect? of our engagement with climate change that they think authentically requires them to poke fun at? It's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. Because, um, I mean, I think there are loads of bizarre things about the way that we engage with it. The most bizarre thing of all is that if climate change is as big a problem as everyone all scientists agree with this, then it's definitely the biggest problem that exists in humanity. But most of us they, like, don't even think about it that much. Like the weirdest thing about it all for me is that you, you, can, you can go weeks without really, well, you can't, you've got your PhD. <laughs> but, um, a, an ordinary person can not engage with it for far longer oh. than you'd think it would be possible when the world is actually on fire. But how you make that funny, I don't know. Although I did like, I like what John said, which is that um, if you can make uh, if you can make people laugh while broadly advocating, it also ties in with what Maeve said about checking in with your values. If you can be funny about stuff while also um, exemplifying certain good habits, like maybe being vegan or cutting down on your use of cars or whatever it might be, then that is a sort of um, circuitous but still useful way of, of getting people to think stuff is cooler than it maybe seems. Because as John said, for years there's been this idea that um, eco-warriors, to use that, uh, shit, pointless term, um, want to take stuff away from you. And it's almost the opposite. You've got to look at what can be positive and enjoyable about it. So to use one, we were talking about this the other day. For years, if you saw bad com comics, it, it probably still happens. But you remember this, one of the most common hack jokes used to be, uh, any, any vegans in? And then no one would put their hands up and they say, yeah, you haven't got the strength to raise your hands. And like there's been... There's been so many, the history of club comedians is about one in three of them doing that. <laughs> um, but now you won't, well, I don't 
you don't often see those kind of comedians around anymore. But I, I, my guess is that you couldn't do that anymore because more comedians are vegans for a start. And more, there's just more of a culture of people, basically collectively, we don't think anymore, vegans are wretched, weak individuals who have weird milk. <laughs> uh, and th that's, a, that's a tiny sort of culture change within comedy. But that's the thing. You know, one thing comedy can be harmful for is having these tropes. Like yep. fat people are like this, vegans are like this whatever, black people drive like this, white people drive, all of these mm. traditional staples of comedy. And one simple thing we can do as comedians is not have jokes which buy into these uh, assumptions, which are only assumptions because everyone laughs at them, but, but which don't actually hold any water. I think that people will look back on the way comedians, I'm not even vegan, but the way that comedians talked about veganism for about 20 or 30 years will one day be cancellable. Although, as John said, being cancelled as a comedian just means uh, you put your feet up for a couple of weeks. <laughs> But that's because of society being rotten to its core and we've only got eight minutes. <laughs> I would say that the gatekeepers in terms of what is put out there on the TV, the commissioners, the people that are coming up with the concepts in terms of what we consume in the mainstream, also have a responsibility to really check in on their values sure. and perhaps change some of the decisions being made in order for us all to kind of experiment with the weird, with the bold, with different sorts of people on the telly, etc to be able to collectively move forward and, and actually work out like the bits that are funny and give us a, a sense of togetherness and joy. Yeah. Lysett's thing is a brave piece of commissioning. Yeah. I think. I'm not yeah. sure you would have seen, you'd see uh, there are comparable comedians 10, 20 years ago, but the sort of stuff he is doing is kind of exciting, I think, to yeah, you guys. Yeah. Because it genuinely is, it presents a challenge of some kind of corporations through the mainstream media, which you, you don't see a lot of that. And you mentioned this kind of like idea that we can turn off from it if we're getting on with our lives because we're all quite busy but i have a hunch that subconsciously it's making us a bit sad and a bit sick and a bit down even if we're not right on the front line engaging with a, a big chat with greta i think that every day we kind of don't feel great when we have to use single-use plastic from the supermarket yeah, like Maeve said, it's about thinking about what your actual values are and adhering to those as much as possible. And if you can combine that with being a public voice, then you, you probably will do some good, whether you do it directly or not. Um, Anonymous says, as comedians, do you think that the science is always represented or is it ignored in the search for a laugh? Anyone? Uh, um, that's that's a great question. I mean, I think science communication is, is difficult, but there's so they have really bent over backwards to make it available to us like the scientists have and i think comedians you know whether it's just you know we just don't research or i don't know but the the information is there and it's you know it's hard to talk about but you'll find a way in always i think um so i don't really because what I worry is that like scientists get the blame for like not communicating properly or for knowing all this stuff and not being able to share it. And, and I think comics, you know, we're communicators and we tell these stories. So I think it's fine for us to go and do a, a bit of research and, you know, to use our powers for good in that way. And it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be frightening at all. You know, there's always, um, there's always a fun, there's always a fun way in like, and that's, that's what we're good at. And I also think comedians are naturally like, I'm talking about us like we're this species, you know, but um, but like we're naturally curious. <laughs> and so we can we can get to be the ones who ask the questions and then allow everyone to put the answers together themselves as well. And in that way we can avoid being too preachy, even though I love preaching. Um, Anonymous has asked this bold question, um, saying lots of comedians write books. Is publishing sustainable? <laughs> In brackets, to Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, there's a fact in the book about how if you, if you have, there's not a huge amount of scientific literature out there telling you exactly what it is. But if you read, if you have an ebook and you read more than 40 books on it, then it's more sustainable than buying those books, I think. There you go, there's a fact for you. <laughs> uh, you're going to write 40 books. <laughs> yeah, 40 books, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, publishing, uh, yeah, 
just go to a library. There you go. That's the most sustainable <laughs> thing. Yeah, save some libraries whilst we're at it. Yeah, exactly. And I would also say that um, there is something kind of mentally healthy about sitting with a book and turning some pages, look after it, pass it on, etc. But I, yeah. just the way that we consume information so quickly can yeah. easily like I mess with us. Books are only unsustainable if they require mass production. In other words, if they're successful, eh? So as long as your book doesn't do well, you're fine. The, <laughs> I think we need to point Fingers the finger crossed. at guys like Josh Widdicombe, who loads of people buy their memoirs. Like, <laughs> we need to go to the top here. <laughs> Me and Matt are fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what emits more carbon, a comedian at the O2 um, with their name written in about 50 footlights or Lady Gaga performing a full concert at the same arena with 50 dancers? <laughs> I'd imagine Lady Gaga. <laughs> uh, comedians are quite low carbon, like you're just by yourself. If you can just cycle everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, our production values mic. are too low for us to be a real menace. Exactly. <laughs> we, we don't have backing dancers. It's not all so, of us. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. But oh, it's, one, it, it's one of those points that we, we've sort of spoken about a lot. And it, uh, the questions are quite interesting because they lead to this. Oh, well, should we not have publishing anymore? And should we not have this kind of gig? And w what world do you want to live in? This, this is all about trying to save the planet. And if what you're saying to people from the outset is you can't go and watch a music gig, you can't watch a comedian, yeah. you can't buy a book, nobody's going to give a shit. Nobody's going to join the fight. So what you've got to say is, how do we have Lady Gaga? I don't want to live without Lady Gaga for Christ's sake. <laughs> but you know, how do we have those concerts? <laughs> we can yeah. we can cycle whilst we watch her. Exactly. We can, yeah. We well, can simply, um, yeah, we can simply seize the assets of the fossil fuel industry <laughs> and nationalise them. <laughs> and then we can go. <laughs> there was such a beautiful smile, just like <laughs> it's, it's how to get you. Um, who is responsible? We've got two minutes. Someone's got to talk at the speed of Dizzy Rascal on this. Is who is responsible for diversifying comedy as a field? Who? Who? All of Comedians, us. Comedians? Yeah, commissioners? all of us. But... Every single person, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, and in different ways. Like, commissioners, the gatekeepers, as you said, need to look at diversity. But then, as comedians, we can decline gigs which are, you know, mm -hmm. diverse. A lot of comedians have started asking to see the lineups and, and, you know, turning down gigs if it's going to be all white men or that kind of thing. So we, we do all have a part to play in it. Yeah. Sure. Agreed. Um, okay, quickly tell us where we can see your latest thing, your latest book, hear your latest podcast. Maeve, take it away. Um, I'd love for you to listen to Mothers of Invention, where I am only in 5% of it, and everybody else is uh, women who are on the forefront of uh, climate action and fighting for climate justice. And thank you for today. Oh, thank you. Amazing. I, I, I'm a big fan of Maeve's podcasts from a geeky climate perspective. So We haven't got time for fangirling. John. <laughs> uh, listen to Maeve's podcast. That's all I was <laughs> Matt. Yeah, listen to Maeve's podcast. Um, and, and buy my book oh, out yeah. next week. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, out next week. Uh, you can buy it anywhere. Audible. Listen What's it, it called again? Uh, it's called Hot Mess. Hot mess. Don't and uh, don't buy it from Amazon. Get it from somewhere else. Um, <laughs> please, Mark. <laughs> Um, Maeve's podcast, really. Yeah. And um, and actually, even worse, I've read Matt's book and it's really good. So I oh. recommend everything by. But in terms of where you can see me, I'm going to call you a bluff. I'm on in Glasgow in like three hours. Oh wow! So um, that's where you can see me down the road. That's so um, exciting. But don't buy my book about the environment from like 12 years ago because the, the conversation has moved on so far from there that it embarrasses me that it exists. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Some of my books are good. Like, by all means, uh, read a novel of mine, but that book was basically... I, 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 read, I read it when I was doing research for my first show and it was... You were a trailblazer. I think oh. at the time it was worth doing, but I don't... It, it, yeah, don't read it now. It's not 2008 but... anymore. No, I've got other books which are good. There we go. Good. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much to you guys watching at home and streaming it on your devices, etc. You guys in the audience, all of the channels that have come together, the top dogs, so that this conversation can be had. I think it's very important. It makes me feel excited and feel like there perhaps is a hopeful, progressive sort of thing that's happening, even in the mainstream. Um, a book that's just come out that wasn't written by me or any of us is called Consumed by Arja Baba uh, and talking about colonialism and consumerism as well, which is another great resource. Mothers of Invention, make sure that we are uh, listening to that. I've been Gemma Kearney. Follow me on Instagram and all the rest of it because I'm still here doing lots of this. And thank you. 
Finals, huh? Look at that.